And so here's a story, and it's a story over in 3 John chapter 1, and he's talking about the journeys of some Christians and them making the right choices and right decisions. And I'm going to pick up there. He's talking to the elders, to the beloved. He says, whom I have loved in truth. He says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth, just as you journey in the truth, okay? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth, journey in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. In other words, when we journey in the truth for things of God and when we really carry in the gospel of God, we do it for those people that we love as brothers and sisters, but we also do it for people we don't even know. Amen? Amen? He goes on to say, he says, Who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a, in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. If we travel this journey worthy of God and on a godly journey, we'll do well. Amen. Amen? Amen? Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. In other words, they didn't take anything from the loss. Amen? Amen? They heard from the, from, the, from the word. It says, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Right? Amen. Now, I said this, and I want to kind of say it again just to kind of get the point out there is we are all on a journey. Now, here's the big question. <clears throat> are you on the right journey? Okay? Because throughout time, men have journeyed on some right, some not so right. Some started right, some ended up wrong. Some started wrong, some find the right path and ended up right. Now, I said all that because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to relate to this. Because, see, all of us in this room, as we journey on, we realize that some of us have started on the right path, and ended up on the wrong path. Some of us started on the wrong path, and hopefully we get to the right path. And so throughout Scripture, we find this to be true. Now, when you read stories about people in the Bible, you read about them, and you hear about all the great things they've done, and for the most part, we see the beginning of the journey, and we see the end of the journey. But we don't see the process of the journey. Because, see, when you realize, you talk about Abram. Now, at the time when he left, he was Abram. Later, he became Abraham, because of the breath of God that breathed upon him, okay? But during this time, you got to remember now, he left a place where he knew where his local Walmart was. Come on. He had a gas station that he frequent. He had a couple of restaurants that he liked. I mean, this was his home. And he left because God told him to go. Now, he left with his wife, Sarah, and he took his nephew, Lot. Now, as he take this journey, you got to remember, along the way, if you read the Scriptures, you'll find out real quick, that Abram, Abraham, made some bad choices. Because see, there was a time that when they were facing a kingdom, when the king decides at that point, if they see someone they won't, they just take them. Now, Sarah obviously was a wah, wah, wah. Come on, somebody. She must have been something. Because here is Abram with Sarah, and all of a sudden now they're approaching, and the king's going, ooh, check out her. And now Abraham's freaked out over this. Because Abram says, she's my sister. Come on. Some of you stunt right there. You never heard that before. Go back and read it. So this is my sister. Now, he was not telling the total lie, but not total truth either at this point. Kind of a half truth. That's right. Half, half truth is a, is, a, is a whole lie, really. And so all of a sudden, the king takes her for his own. Because, see, Abraham now is freaked out because he's thinking that if, if he knows that I'm her husband and he wants her bad enough, he'll take me out. He'll kill me. Okay, but later on, when the king finds out that he wasn't telling the whole truth and he was revealed, the king was revealed, all of a sudden now the king is, he's scared and he realized that Abraham is God's chosen one. And so he begins to bless Abraham in spite of all those things. Amen. Can I tell you, in spite of sometimes we take the wrong turn or say the wrong thing in the journey, if God is in it, God's still going to bless it. Come on now. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Come on now. Amen. Sometimes we get off the wrong track. But when God is there, God always seems to bounce us back up on the wrong track. Amen? I told the story. Matter of fact, when I preached at my mama's funeral, I talked about my mama and some of the things that she did. And, and, and my mother-in-law later told me, she said, you'll never preach my funeral. She said, <laughs> so you told too many things about your mama that, that you know, nobody else knew about. And I said, my mama, I said, you think Carrie Underwood wrote the song, 
you know, Jesus got, you know, Jesus at the wheel, take the wheel or whatever it is. I said, my mama wrote that song. <laughs> so I remember when I was 12 years old, we was driving down the road, and she's driving. And my mother, bless her, she's, she's going to be with Jesus. But when she ran off the road, she ran off the road and didn't try to get back on the road. She would throw her hands up. And I remember this so plain. She ran off the road. She threw her hands up. And she says, Jesus, Jesus. And that car went right back on the road. Now, at 12 years old, you go, I mean, you're doing everything. I mean, God, you're here. I mean, you're bringing back all the bottles you stole from the neighborhood store. I mean, you're doing it all, man, you know. But when you cry out to Jesus, no matter what path you get off on, he bounces you right back on the right path. That's the Jesus that we serve. We see Abram. We see many others. Here's another one here. Many know the story of Jonah. Now, some of you don't know this. Jonah was a proven prophet. This was not Jonah's first time that Christ was, or God was trying to use Jonah. But see, Jonah said, you know what? I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Leesville. Come on, somebody. I'm going to Derrida. I'm going somewhere else. You see, what happened was when he told him to go to Nineveh to save Nineveh, he wanted to prophesy over Nineveh, he decided he didn't want to do that. So he jumped on the wrong boat. Come on, somebody. He took the wrong journey. He immediately started off wrong. But you know what? Sometimes God has a, a way of getting our attention. In his case, you slapped him upside the head and threw him overboard, and the big old big mouth bass swallowed him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Took him in. Now, guess what? He ended up on the right journey, but he started off on the wrong journey. And God had to do something to get his attention. All through history, you find that. Look, you don't think Adam didn't start off on the wrong journey? Come on. Adam started on the wrong journey, but he had somebody in his ear telling him something different. Got him off the wrong journey. Hello, somebody. What about Paul? Yeah, yeah. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. We love to talk about Paul because he wrote a lot of scriptures. I mean, he was in prison. He wrote all these scriptures. We live by these scriptures he wrote. But you know what? Paul was the guy who was crucifying Christians. Yeah. Paul was the one that was holding the coat for Stephen. Yeah. He thought he was doing the right thing. And he thought he was doing all the right things because he had all this religion inside of him. Yeah. But you know what? He put all his religion aside when all of a sudden his big old flashlight blinded him on the road of Damascus. And God wanted to get his attention. Christ wanted to get his attention. Yeah. Guess what? On the road to Damascus, he found out he was on the wrong journey. Come on now. Yeah. But here's another truth about that story. I mean, you don't know this. We talk about Paul because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but there was a guy by the name of Ananias who knew who Paul was. At the time, his name was Saul. He wasn't even Paul yet. And knew who he was and knew that he crucified Christians. And all of a sudden, God is speaking to Ananias and said, go to Saul, which will be Paul with a name change, and tell him what he's supposed to do. Now. now, some of you are thinking, well, I would have done the same thing. Really? Yeah, come on. Really? After seeing what Saul and Paul at this point was doing to Christians, he was crucifying Christians. He was killing them. Yeah. Yeah. But Ananias heard from God and went and told Paul what God said and radically changed the course of Paul's life. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something. You never know what you're going to say to somebody that's going to radically change the course of their life. See, your journey is not just your journey. I just let that marinate out there for a little while. You think your journey is just your journey? It's not just your journey. Your journey is people that God puts around you. Now, let me just say this, and I'm going to deal with this a little later. But your journey, because of your influence, can influence somebody to take the wrong journey. And here's the real reality of that as a Christian. You ready for this? The blood is on your hands. You'll be accountable for that. We don't like to hear that part, do we? See, we're all on a journey. God has a great purpose for us in our life. And we must, as believers... Get on the right journey that God has chosen for us. And so this morning, saying all that, I'm going to sum this up in just a few things here. But one of the things that I want to really deal with today is how do we today, maybe we got on the wrong journey, maybe we took the wrong turn, and maybe we made the wrong decisions, but how do we as believers, as Christians, so I'm talking to Christians this morning, as Christians, as believers, as knowing the truth, how do we stay on the right journey. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Amen. First things first. You ready? Very simple. 
Jesus first. Jesus first. What does the scripture say? The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else you need will be added to you. You see, many of you think today, well, pastor, you just don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. You don't know my boss. You don't know. Listen, I might not know those things, but I'm going to tell you this, unless Jesus first in your life, all those other things that you think are important, they're not that important. You might think they are. You see, if you come to me and tell me, say, listen, praise God, God just gave me a new job, and I'm going to make twice the amount of money, and I'll ask you, well, did you pray about it? No, but how can you not pass this up? Are you kidding me? Really? Are you kidding me? Now, you can look at me with your eyes and go, well, Pastor, I can buy a bigger house. I can have a better car. Can I tell you something? If that's where your happiness is, you've already, you're already confused. You've already messed up. You're already on the wrong track. You're already on the wrong path. Because if your happiness is in things, when things are gone, your happiness is gone. You got to find your happiness and your peace is only in Jesus Christ. Pastor, you say that because you have a nice truck. You say that because, no, I say that because I put Jesus first. I say that whenever we had five kids or five of us was in a car and Caleb, over six foot tall, we were in a, in a sprint. Come on, somebody. A two door hatchback sprint, got back from Russia, and I had a luggage on the top that I know it was my fault before you even say it. I did it, okay? <laughs> I strapped the luggage down, and the whole topping caved in, so we're driving down the road like this. Caleb's got a boombox boom in the back, and his brothers don't have, they sit on each other's lap because Caleb's like, I gotta bring my boombox, you know? <laughs> Why you say that, Pastor? Because I'm telling you, that was like one of the happiest moments of our life. That's right. Well, Pastor, y'all were sitting, y'all were crowded, y'all were this. Listen, can I tell you something? When you put Jesus first in your journey, Amen. that's all that matters. That's all that matters. You might think, and see, here's the problem, is the world will tell you otherwise. The world will try to convince you that your happiness is in money, your happiness in things, your happiness is this and this. I'm telling you this morning, listen to what I'm saying to you as a pastor. If you're a born-again believer today, if Jesus is not first, you're miserable. You're miserable. You want to get on the right journey, put Jesus first, no matter what you do or where you go. Here's the next thing. Ready for this? If you're going to stay on the right journey, you better be ready to walk through open doors. Because, see, Christ is going to open those doors. But, see, here's the problem. You ready for this? He's going to close doors, too. But here's what we do. This is what we do. I did this this morning. Let me just take this right here from you, Ms. Cassandra. I know it's right there next to you. I'm going to move this out of the way. We act like this is, this is a door, for just hypothetically speaking. This is a door. I know it's a chair. I don't get confused. This doctrine's wrong, you know. <laughs> But just for, just for a moment, this could be a door, okay? And all of a sudden, now we're praying. Because let me, let's say, well, let me before I show you this illustration, let me read this to you. Colossians 4, verse 1. He's talking here, and he's saying, Master, give your bond service what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Then he's talking about grace here, Christian's grace. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, being diligent in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God will open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ in which I am also in chains. Now, he's talking about open doors to really teach the gospel. Now, let me just stop for a second. That's the most important thing that we do. Pause. Soak. Say it again. That's one of the most important things we can do is give the gospel. Or, or do we not live under the fact that, you know, we're commissioned to do so? Hello? Am I talking to the wrong church? Because, see, we're commissioned. We're commissioned to do these things. And here's the the reality of it. I can tell you all day long about the gospel, and you can get saved, and you can go to heaven, but you're going to have to face it one day that you didn't go through the open doors that God opened for you. And then you begin to knock down doors that was closed, because we do that all the time. God opens these doors, but yet sometimes he closes the doors. And when he closes the door, instead of us not going through it, we kick it over. We knock it over and we step over what's down because we can get around it. And we wonder why in the world we get in trouble when we get on the other side of it. Man, I'm talking to somebody today. I'm trying to get us to understand this morning that our choices are important. Our choices are important not only for our family but for our lives. You don't never know. If you look, if you're on the wrong journey this morning, and we're going to pray in just a little while, Because my prayer this morning, that if you feel like you're on the wrong journey, we're going to pray that God begins to reveal the right one to you. Because, listen, you're one miserable guy or one miserable girl if you're on the wrong journey. 
God is trying to open doors for us on our journey. Here's the next thing. When we journey for Christ, we must know this, that there will be times where we will be uncomfortable. Yeah. Uncomfortable. Because, see, not everything is roses. When you're doing what's right for God, you're going to suffer persecution. And you will be uncomfortable, and the people around you will be uncomfortable. And that's what it reads over the message. It's what it says in the message. It says, you're blessed when you commit it to God's provoked persecution. He says, the persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out and speak lies about you or discredit. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they're uncomfortable. Now, there are times when you will be uncomfortable because people will attack you. Now, if you have never been attacked for being a Christian and doing what's right for you and your family, then then you're not even on earth. All of us at some level for doing the right thing will be attacked. We got to understand that if we're on the journey of Christ, we have to understand there will be attacks. There will be times we'll be uncomfortable. But we must understand if we're doing the right thing, we listen. Do you know that you have to know that you know that you know? I know that's deep. But we must know. Listen, folks, God is trying to get men and women to the place that He wants you to go. And I'm not going to build this doctrine, and please don't leave here thinking this is not the message. I'm just going to lay this out there. There's a perfect and a permissive. Now, some of you got that already. You know, we, we can say, okay, God, I want to do what you called me to do. I want to journey on the way you want me to journey. Or we can settle for something good. Now, Pastor, is that bad? It can be. Because, see, good can be an enemy to best. See, God has a good plan for you. God has his blessed plan. When, God, when we journey on the way to God, when we put God first and we walk through the doors he wants us to walk to and we stop when he puts a thing in, 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 to stop us, you know, we, we get so confused sometimes. We're so confused because we let our analytical stinking thinking get in the way. We think that we have all the answers. Can I tell you something? You're not that smart. Pastor, you just cut me down. I'm talking to myself, too. Because none of us are that. Look, if you think you got all the answers for the rest of your life, you're fooling yourself. you want an analytical sugar high. Come on, somebody. You're fooling yourself. Because, see, when we put Christ first, we have to trust that when he says to us, he says in the Scripture, don't even lean. Don't even prop yourself up on your own understanding. If we're going to travel this journey we call Christianity, this journey we call life, we must trust that God knows what he's doing. And when these things happen, we must say, okay, God, I don't quite understand all these things, but God, I know that I'm trusting you, and God, I know that I got you first in my life, so God, I know that you're going to get me to the other side of them. You have to believe that, folks. You have to trust that. Not everything is going to be that comfortable, but Christ is always there. Here's the next thing is this. And this is one here that it's, I, I wrote it kind of simple, but I want to kind of explain it to you. It's, we have to remember this. <clears throat> remember, journey, not race. Now, for some of you, you might be confused. And you've heard people say this. We have to understand that we're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. Because, see, sometimes we think it's all about getting there quick. Even when we sow and we reap, we talk about the sowing part and we talk about the reaping part. But we never talk about the process. Look, how many times have you went outside and said, you know what, I'm going to plant a garden. You put all the tomato plants out there and say, well, in the morning, I'm going to get up early so I'm going to get the tomatoes. It don't happen like that. It takes, there's a process that takes place. It's got to water it. You know, the sun shines. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a time goes by, it's elapsed, and finally you get your tomatoes. But see, we're so impatient. We think if we plant it, we're going to get it the next day. Even the same thing with running this race. We had to understand this is, this is a journey. This is not a race. Amen. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because he even says in the Scripture, he says that, let me, let me read one to you right here, over in Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, why did you read that, Pastor? Because many times we're on the right journey. We know God's called us to do the right thing. And we're doing the right thing. And for whatever reason, we get off the track 
and all of a sudden we just lose sight of the, of the journey at all together, God never lose sight of it. God never lose sight of it. See, his calling that he has for you, the plan he has for you, irrevocable. Irrevocable. No matter, listen, there are times we get off the wrong journey, but guess what? God has never left us. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. God already knows what he's got planned for you. But we have to wake up sometimes because we run in this race and we run in so fast, we get out of breath, we fall down, we flop on the ground, and we think the journey's over. The journey's not over. God's never given up on us. We're tired, we're weary. Look, even when the Israelites were crossing the desert, there were people that were falling back because they were weary. You know what they were doing? They were getting picked off. The enemy was picking them off because they were falling behind. Listen, can I tell you something? I I tell people all the time, and and Mike reminded me this a while back, you take two positions, you're either up or getting up. We need to realize that sometimes when we get our feet knocked underneath us, God has not left us. If I felt like God has left me and my call was revocable by God, I'd have left here 10 years ago. Don't stop me now, bro. I'm going to roll. Pastor, oh, my God. <laughs> You're not spiritual. <laughs> We're human. We're human. Yeah. What do you think? My kids wake up in the morning going, Father. <laughs> please read me a devotional. Why mother cooks pancakes and picks up the eggs out of the chicken pen in the back? That's right. We, we fall into that trap, man. It's more like, get up! Mama's got a ding-dong with a Dr. Pepper. He didn't get out of here, you know. <laughs> they don't make ding-dongs anymore. <laughs> Honey buns and a Dr. Pepper, right, man? Things are not always perfect. Amen? Until we recognize that, until we realize. You see, here's here's what happens. We look through the window, and we see, oh, look how sweet they look. (laughs) She's like, "Mm mm-mm. Things must be great in this home. The children's all dressed so polite. They don't realize they got issues in the home. What window are you looking for? (laughs) Yes. Now, I know good and well, each one in this room, when you wake up in the morning, (laughs) you got to brush your teeth, amen? Amen. (laughs) If you don't, (laughs) whoo. Why do you keep saying that, Pastor? Because, listen, all of us at some level are going to fall off the journey, every one of us. And we need to understand that God is there, and his calling that he has for us, his purpose he has for us is irrevocable. He's still calling. Amen. He hasn't. Listen, I thank God that, that my God never gave up on me. Amen. I thank God for that. I thank God that I was talking about this just the other night. I thank God that I had a mother who never gave up on me. I thank God that my mama prayed for me even when I was just wrong, wrong track, wrong road. She prayed for me, never quit praying for me, never gave up on me. And see, by me saying that today, maybe there's someone here today that's hearing this. And maybe you're thinking the same thing. You know what? I won't never give up on my child. I won't never give up on my marriage. I won't ever give up on these things. Because God has a plan for you. His calling is irrevocable. Amen. Amen? And this path that we take, it's a journey, not a race. But here's the great thing about the journey. Great things about God's journey is every day is a new day. Every day is a new day. Well, let me read this to you. Limitations 3.21. It says, This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says to my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Going back to what I said earlier, because of his compassions, they never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. 
See, the God that we serve knew a long time ago, from time to time, we were going to get off path. And he's trying to tell us here, he's going, listen, every day I'm going to be compassionate. Every day my mercy is going to be fresh and new every morning. What did we say? You said two days. What was it talking about? Two most important days in a man's life is today and tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. No, no, you don't worry about today and tomorrow or yesterday. What did you say, Terry? You told me that yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday and tomorrow. Yeah. Two days you really can't really have concern about was yesterday and tomorrow. Because yesterday you really, it, it's gone and tomorrow, the Bible says don't worry about it. Yeah. Has enough of his own. Amen? Understanding that the journey we're on, God has a purpose and a plan. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going here. Here's the next thing. God's journey is everlasting and it never ends. God's journey is everlasting and it never ends. Romans 6.20 says, For you, when you were slaves of sin, you were free. I'm sorry. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you then, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For in of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, and have your fruit to holiness and to the end everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death, but a gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That's the gift that we have. Amen. You see, if you're in Jesus, if you're in Christ, the journey you have is an everlasting journey. When you think of everlasting, brother, that's a, that's a deep, 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 deep well to really try to grasp. But understanding that, you know, sometimes things happen, and we think that that's going to determine or, or really shape our lives. But see, Christ's got an everlasting plan. We have a day-to-day -day plan, so to speak. You know, it's like somebody committing murder or somebody being an adulteress or whatever. You might call them a murder. You might call them an adulteress. But can I tell you something? That's not who they are. That's just what they've done. Does that make sense? And until we see that, and until we see that God sees past our, our, our murders or past our adulterous plan, past those things, and he's got an everlasting plan, a plan that, listen, will go on and on and on. Here's, here's the next thing about that. Romans 14, 9 says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be both Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brothers? Question. Why do you show content for your brothers? Question. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And here's a good part here to really interject this right here. You know, can I tell you, sometimes you might think it's okay and you can handle it, whatever the case may be, but you got to be careful that you don't do something that's going to stumble your brother. Because, see, we can do that really easy. We can say, well, I don't have a problem with that, but you don't know the person next to you. I remember one time we were in a church in Baton Rouge, and this guy one time was in, and I was just a, a young believer, and I think we were just young marriage. And, not, and, and I remember this guy was an older guy, and he said, he says, for me, playing pool is a sin. And I, and I chewed on that for a while, and I'm thinking, what are you doing, you idiot? I mean, I, really, I'm thinking, pool? Are you, what, are you, what are you saying to me? You know, and, and the whole time he said this, I'm thinking to myself, Man, this guy's out there. Woo! He's gone until I heard his story. Because, see, once I heard his story, I realized what he was trying to tell me. This guy was a pool shark. Before he met Christ, that's what he did. He traveled around and he played pool and he beat people out of money. And I mean, that was his lifestyle. And for him, playing pool was a sin. Why? Because it was a stumbling block for him and the people that he was involved with. Now, for, for you and I, I mean, we could play pool all day long or, or, or do something that might not cause any problem. 
But for him, it was a stumbling block. And see, sometimes we got to recognize that stumbling blocks can help other people or hurt other people stumble too. We need to move them out of the way. Amen? Let me end up with this right here. The last thing is today is this. Here's the last of the truths about our journey. We almost face it. Your journey and the path it takes is your choice. It's your journey. You see, we're quick to blame everybody else. And I will be accountable for things I do wrong. But when the rubber hits the road, it's your journey. It's your choice. You don't know how many times I've heard people say, I quit going to church because of that deacon, you know, sister big bottom and brother do nothing, whatever. You know, I, 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 I. and guess what? They have a, a legit complaint because perhaps they did do something. But at the end of the day, when they face the king of kings, God ain't going to say, listen, because of big bottom or big mouth or whatever, I'm going to let you slide. It's your choice, your journey. Let me read this passage of Scripture here, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as you are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by when we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God and of children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Talking about a journey and talking about sometimes journeys getting off track or whatever the case may be. And, and the hard truth for all this, and you can blame me to you blue in the face. You can blame everybody around you to you blue in the face. But the hard truth is it's your journey and your choice. Your journey, your choice. Julia talked about last week how this comedian was talking about how, you know, kids would go back to their parents, their 40 year old kids, parents 80 years old, and like, what do you want me to do? A do over? You know, raise you again? Now that I had a stroke, I'm a little bit more calmer than I used to be, you know? And we laugh about that, but guess what? As much as that father did all the wrong things, it's still their journey. It's still your journey. See, that's the part that, that I try my best to really hammer home because I'm not belittling some of the things that happened to you. I'm not belittling the fact that some of you were raised in a very dysfunctional home. I'm not belittling the fact that some of you were molested. I'm not belittling the fact that some of your parents left. I'm not belittling the fact that you have some horrible stories. I'm not belittling any of those things. But here's the reality of the truth. All those things that happened, Christ died for those things. Christ died so we could be set free. Christ died to give us the gospel that we can live a better life because we don't have to live on the past or dwell on the past or worry about what Auntie or Bobette or Momo or whatever did. We can say, you know what? Today's the day of salvation. Today is my day. I choose this day. I want this day. This is my choice. This is my decision. And do what's right because it's right. I remember one time, kids were smaller and they were teenagers, and somebody was a leader in the back. And they came to me, and they said, I told your son he shouldn't do that because he's the pastor's son. And I looked him dead in the eye, and I bowed up, and I said, don't you ever tell my kids not to do something because they're the pastor's son. You tell them not to do it because it's right or wrong. You don't tell them because of who I am. Because, see, who I am doesn't matter one day. It's going to be their choice that matters. And we need to quit living in the past and live in the future and quit dwelling on, on poor, pitiful me and all the things that happened to me. I could pull out my fiddle right now and, and play a song, you know, probably hit the top charts of the country and western, you know. But it doesn't matter. That's the point I'm trying to get to you. It doesn't matter anymore. We must see that God came and died so we could have life, life with an abundance, and it's your choice, your choice. 
Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you that no matter what I say, God, some water, some plant, but God, only you bring the increase. God, only you by the Spirit can speak to the hearts of every man, woman, and child. And God, maybe there's someone in here today because of reasons of the past, because of problems in the past, have just really lived their whole life looking back, reaching back. God, today, let them not allow their past to determine their future. Let their past be their past and let their journey be ahead of you. God, you said, you said the prize of the high calling is in front of us. God, you said that we need to reach forward. God, you said, even in, 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 as a reminder in the New Testament, one of the smallest scriptures, God, you said, remember Lot's wife. She looked back. God, we're not looking back. We're not worried about our past. God, we're worried about our future, and our future is with you. God, on this day, God, I pray by the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit just to fall in this place, and you begin to penetrate every heart, every man, every woman, every child. God, at the sound of this mic, God, it brings an understanding. God, if they need to get something right, today they'll do it. Today they'll do it. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I want to pray for this one thing first. First thing I want to pray for is you today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, man, some of these things about journey really hit me between the eyes. Some of these things you talked about a journey, man, I related to. Some of these characters in the scriptures that you talked about, man, I related to them. And I realized that, man, I just need to get, my, I need to get back on the right journey, whatever that may be. I don't know, need to know the issue, don't know the situation. And I really, it's between you and God. But I want you to know that I want to pray for you today. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me because one of these things you said really pierced my heart. And I realized that I need to make some right choices, better choices. And I need to get right on the right track. No one's going to call you out. No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to ask you to stand. None of these things. Just want to pray for you. If this hits you today, raise your hand right where you're at and just put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Just raise it and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you that we can come and call on the name Jesus, and you're always there. God, I pray today as this message, God, I pray that from the heart, people receive it in their hearts. And God, I pray today that if there's someone, these hands popped up all over this place, God, there are people that are struggling in their, their journey. Whatever it may be, God, whatever, whatever it is, God, there are hands all over this place. God, you know already. God, I can sit here and I can generically name off all these different areas, but God, you already know. So God, I ask you, I ask you by the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that you begin to show them, begin to direct them, begin to guide them, begin to give them, God, what they need to, to, to make the right choices and right steps to move forward. God, let your name get all the glory. God, it's not about us. It's about you and what you can do for us. So God, blessings be upon these people. God, I thank you right now that you're challenging and changing lives. I thank you that those people that are here today maybe didn't even raise their hand. God, whatever they stand in need of, God, you're God that provides all those things. Still, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. Or maybe, maybe you might say, Pastor, there was a time I was serving the Lord and, and I realized I'm just backslidden and I want to get that right today. Right there between you and God, from the heart, just simply pray, Jesus, Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come to my life today. Jesus, I make you mine and I am yours. And Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe you prayed it as a prayer rededication. Again, it doesn't matter to me. It's between you and God. But every head bow and eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer today, again, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you. I just want to pray for you. You prayed that prayer today. Just slip up your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit of the Lord. Anyone else? 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. God, I thank you for those hands. God, those hands need fellowship. God, those hands need life spoken into them. God, whatever they need, you're God that provides. God, I pray you put godly men and women in their path. God, I pray that they'll get plugged in in areas they need to be fed in. God, whatever they stand in need of, you're God that provides all those things. Blessings be upon them on this day. Blessings on this day. God, we pray all these things that we say, all the things that we do. God, we do unto you. We do unto you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm sorry, just one more thing. God just laid on my heart to do. No one looking around. Just give me just a moment with this. Maybe you're here today for whatever reason. For whatever reason, you might say, Pastor, I either never been baptized. Pastor, I was baptized and didn't know what I was doing. I realized that I really want to be baptized so I can really, really just say that the old person is dead and the new person is alive again. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a leader or a deacon. It doesn't matter to me. I know it's the first time I've asked this question. And I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you any more than this. But if God is really moving on your heart to do something like this, I want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. Again, I'm not going to call you out. Nothing. But if God is really moving on your heart for something like this, maybe you've been fearful, scared, or whatever the case may be, I just want to pray for you. If that's you this morning, just slip up your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. God, I, I, I believe right now that you're going to speak to these hearts. Let them realize that as they're obedient in their faith, God, you're obedient with your word. God, give them strength. Give them abilities to carry out their journey through baptism. Blessings be upon them. God, I thank you again for this amazing day. Blessings on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To receive that word, let's give God a hand this morning. Amen.